Hi, I'm uh, Jim Holt, and I'm uh, here talking to Tom Vanderbilt, who is the author of this marvelous new book, uh, Traffic, Why We Drive the Way We Do, and What It Says About Us. That's right. It's a rather long subtitle, but a good one. Um, Tom, is a, uh, Tom, you're a uh, writer on technology and uh, design and culture for the New York Times, uh, and you contribute to Slate and elsewhere. Uh, and I am uh, a, a, a writer for the New York Times Magazine and The New Yorker, and I just wrote a book called Stop Me If You've Heard This, A History and Philosophy of Jokes. Uh, that's the last thing I'll say uh, in a vain attempt to plug my book. We're here to talk about Tom's book, and we're here, and which is a, um, I read it in, in, over the weekend, and uh, it's a real page turner. It's, it, it's an encyclopedic a treatise on everything having to do with driving, on psychology, on the physics of it, on engineering, on how tr uh, drivers interact with pedestrians, on how people drive in, in Delhi and in Beijing and Tokyo and in, in New York. Uh, and Tom, I have to say, I, uh, I'm not a driver myself. I let my license expire um, a couple of years ago, and I'm very okay. anti-car culture. Mm -hmm. But just from a purely intellectual point of view, your material is so, is so rich. I mean, you have... Uh, it, to me, as a sort of a failed scientist and mathematician, what's really interesting about driving is that it, it, it involves a, uh, a nonlinear dynamics. And whenever you have nonlinear uh, non dynamics, all kinds of rich and surprising phenomena emerge. And, you know, there was something counterintuitive and surprising on, on every page of your book. Um, so just, just to, to, uh, to get things started, what is the, the single most surprising and counterintuitive uh, a discovery you made about about traffic, about any aspect of traffic, when you when you were researching and writing this book. Um, well, it's a, it's a good question. I mean, there's so many things, but I mean, one thing is just it relates to what you said about uh, nonlinear. I, I guess it's sort of this tension between the desires of the individual and what might be best for the system, which you see expressed in a lot of ways in, in traffic, as I understand it. Um, a famous example, I've just come back from L.A., and they have these things, uh, ramp meters, which we don't really deal with in New York, but they're those little traffic signals on the end of uh, highway on-ramps. I'm not sure if you've experienced those. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. Anyway, yeah, sure, um, sure, yeah. So, you know, they hold up the individual driver, and you're sitting there on the ramp, and it looks like the freeway is flowing quite nicely to you, so you're thinking, well, why are they holding me up? And then, you know, the reason, of course, is they're holding you up is precisely that, because you're... The, the freeway is flowing because you're being held up. So, you know, and, and this ties into various, uh, the, the good way that's been uh, used to describe this involves rice and pouring rice through a funnel and pouring it in different ways. And, you know, this is sort of Mr. Wizard Science 101, but, um, you know, pouring the rice slowly takes longer as a full, the, the activity takes longer, but the rice actually goes through the beaker, through the funnel faster mm -hmm. than if you just sort of dump all the rice in at once. And just, thinking of cars as little grains of rice trying to enter that freeway and thinking of the freeway as a funnel. Um, you know, just... So, you know, I, I think as drivers, we are we have nothing but the individual perspective and the kind of, you know, Adam Smith, if we can say that, you know, pursuing our individual goals and, and liberty. And, um, you know, the system often works better if we would suspend those a little bit or if we were managed uh, more as a yeah, group yeah. rather than as an individual. So, so that, that's one thing, I think. Yeah, so um, I mean, it's interesting that in that case... Um, you know, not only are, can you think of the cars as little grains of rice trying to get through an opening, but each grain of rice is 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 piloted in this case by an agent who's trying to be rational and who's operating according to some you know fairly simple rules and operating with a, a very a, a, a cognitive apparatus that was um, evolved for very different sorts of situations, not evolved for moving at thirty or sixty miles an hour, um, and. Um, and, and also, the individual drivers can be can be rational, and uh, they can be making optimal decisions for themselves. But then, when you look at, at, at the, the traffic as a whole, the system as a whole, it's a mess. And I mean, a good example of that is uh, is the notorious activity known as rubbernecking, right? I mean, I've always, when I was reading, uh, you had some very fascinating uh, pages on the phenomenon of rubbernecking and you know, slowing down to to see a gruesome accident by the side of the road. We all love to do that. It's, you know, it, for some reason, it's highly entertaining. And, of course, if I'm driving along and there's an accident by the side of the road, it's rational for me to slow down and look because I enjoy looking. And 
if just because I slow down, if 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 if, if uh, nobody else slows down, my slowing down won't really impede traffic. If everyone else slows down, I might as well, well slow down and take a look too. And if, and so you know, it's it's really rational for me to rubberneck. Um, and so uh, I wonder, you know, how do we avoid? Having traffic jams on the freeway, I mean, this happens, you know, every day, I suppose, in the Los Angeles area, New York area, that have to do with rubbernecking. What sort of uh, measures could, could we take to, you know, to prevent something which is, after all, rational for individuals to do, even though it leads to a collective uh, mess? Yeah, and, well, and just to, to first of all, cite uh, Thomas Schelling on that, because that really is his idea of, of that kind of, you know, each individual action we take, these micro motives, you know, working into a collective macro behavior that seems to be worse for everyone. So if we, yeah, if we could somehow all just agree, sign a pledge before we get on the road to not rubberneck, the uh, situation would evaporate. Um, but I, I have no good answer for that, except, I mean, the things that have been tried include things like these screens. Uh, in England, they've done this, yeah. which actually <laughs> erect sort of, you know, Christo-style bands of fabric in front of these crash scenes to, to you know, basically prevent people from looking. Uh, of course, you know, you can imagine how cumbersome these things are and how hard it would be to get out to the highway and erect these things. Uh, and then people might find interest in the screen itself because virtually anything uh, can trigger interest on the highway. And I, again, I was just in L.A. I was standing over an overpass, um, not something I normally do. I was doing some filming, but just my presence on that overpass was causing su- such a flurry of, of uh, waving, horn honking. Uh, the, the California Highway Patrol was called because I think they thought I might be a jumper. Um, and then I saw someone, <laughs> I saw a man on a bicycle um, going in the breakdown lane on, uh, this is the Ventura Freeway. Bicycling is not permitted. Um, and, you know, but there he was. So uh, that another form of rubbernecking was sort of going on watching this guy. So, um yeah, I have. No and you good. see the most improbable things. It's amazing, as you pointed out, increasingly, uh, you you see the, not only things by the side of the road, but actually in the road. You know, when I uh, I used to drive from New York down to Virginia on um, Interstate uh, 81, and uh, year after year there would be more and more detritus actually in the road. You know, huge strips of rubber uh, that were thrown off by reconditioned uh, uh, tractor trailer tra- tires, that sort of thing. And I think you pointed out in your book. At, at some point on the on, was the Hollywood Expressway in California, there was actually a prefabricated house that was sitting in the road or by the side of the road. You said for, for a couple of weeks uh, with a with a sign on it that said "For Rent." Apparently, it, it had been uh, it was being trucked along, and the truck hit a, a, a uh, an over an overpass, and the, the the house ended up on the on the Hollywood Expressway. It's sort of it, it sort of beggars belief that it could have been there for two weeks. Is that really possible? Did that really happen? It, it did, yeah. I mean, and and there's no sort of end to the list of things that have shown up on those uh, highways, ranging from you know porta potties that have fallen off the back of trucks to to agricultural loads to you know cooking oil to um, the aforementioned uh, jumpers. Um, dogs on the freeway are a big thing, particularly on the days after July Fourth. Um, you know, and this is why. Well, I should also add there's a fascinating part of the DOT uh, site or the CHP site, uh, California Highway Patrol, in which the, these incidents are, you can read them as they are announced by the police themselves. And, and it's sort of a, a constantly unscrolling and, and kind of these cryptic little, uh, almost like Coens or something, you know, of, of little bits of insight with strange, you know, descriptions of what's going on. So I highly recommend this as a kind of uh, afternoon time killer. But... Um, mm. So yeah, I mean that's why incident response, as they call it, you know, is has become key because if you're not if you're talking about working with the system you have, you, you it's unaffordable in some cases to build more infrastructure, you know, but just clearing these incidents would improve the flow to such an extent. So I mean that's that's become sort of like the watchword amongst uh, traffic control officials. I right, would say. Right. Let, let me ask you. Well, let me ask you one practical question, and then I want to get into some more um, some more of these uh, <clears throat> surprising uh, counterintuitive theoretical uh, uh, principles that you that you talk about in the book. The practical mm-hmm. question first: When I when I drive on the interstate, let's say the uh, the speed limit is sixty five miles an hour, and I tend to go go by the rules and drive exactly at you know sixty two to sixty four miles an hour, just under the speed limit, and almost everyone around me is going about 10 miles an hour faster than I am. Uh, and 
um, you know, this is this is you know considered to be it's you know it, it it's informally considered acceptable to drive a little bit over the speed limit, especially on uh, interstates. And people driving with me say, Jim, you should drive at the same speed as everybody else. E if you obey the speed limit, you're driving 10 miles an hour more slowly than the median driver, and you're, therefore you're, you're creating a risk. Uh, it's safer if everyone, what, what's the, what causes danger uh, on the road is not speed itself, but the variance among the speeds of the, of the different drivers. And so I would be, I would be safer, they, my, my passenger would claim, if I would drive 10 miles over the speed limit at the same speed everyone else is driving. And, and as, you know, as you point out in your book, every time, the, you know, the, the argument against that is whenever you increase your speed, you're increasing two things, both the risk of having an accident and the damage that would be caused by, by the accident, by the collision. And I think you said, you know, both of these increase exponentially. So on the one hand, I'm thinking if I go 10 miles an hour, I'm, you know, I may be doubling my chance of getting of, of, a, of an accident, and, if, and the accident will be, you know, three times as serious. On the other hand, if I don't travel at the same speed as everyone else, I'm, I'm creating a risk both for them and for myself. So how do you, how do you resolve this dilemma? Uh, it's, it's a very good question, and um, there's many additional problems there as well. But, um, yeah, I mean, first of all, obviously, you know, the, the interstate highway is the safest statistically road you have. Or, that's not to say that driving faster on it doesn't increase the risk on that road. I mean, it is safer than other sorts of roads, but it's not like the risk is equal at all speeds, even on that road. So, um, but, yeah, I mean, what you're talking about is this, and it's become sort of a, you know, um, a mantra, if you will, of, of kind of a certain type of driver, certain uh, very pro-motoring groups that, you know, it's really not speed per se that's an issue, it's the speed variance. And, uh, you know, it sort of goes back to these studies that were done in the 60s. And the problem is, is that those were done on roads with a real variety of mixed speeds, including cars entering from things like driveways. And, uh, you know, again, I was just in L.A. and I was out filming with some people and I was involved, uh, well, secondarily in a crash. And... Um, at an intersection, and what had happened was a person was accelerating to make the light through a yellow light, and they hit someone who had been stopped because there was a driver waiting to come out of a, a driveway. So if you sort of analyze the, the who was at the crash risk there, it would show that, oh, it was the high-speed driver, and then it was the low-speed driver, low being, in this case, zero miles per hour. So um, that, that's where the statistics on that, you know, get a little bit strange. But, you know, right. on, the, on the highway, I think in general, you know, harmonization would be better, but, you know, at what point do, do you reach this point where the risk becomes greater than the speed variance problem? I, you know, I don't know. There's uh, obviously different drivers have different reaction speeds, so getting an older driver to suddenly be driving 80, 85 miles an hour, I think that risk might be potentially worse mm -hmm. than right, right. Uh, asking them to you know, go the same speed. And, um, you know, when you actually look at the crash statistics, the types of crashes you would think would be caused by this speed variance on highways, these sort of uh, rear end or same direction speeds, uh, same direction crashes at high speeds are actually not sort of that frequent. Uh, the real big problem is, again, cars being stopped unexpectedly. And that's, that is speed variance, but you know, not the kind. As I, I think in general, mm -hmm. it, more is made of the issue than is really uh, the case. And obviously, trucks are generally going at a slower speed. Um, on the Autobahn in Germany, you have cars going upwards of 100 miles an hour and then trucks traveling in the right lane where they're restricted to be. And, you know, speed variance is huge there, and yet the crash rate uh, tends to be lower than the U.S. It's not to say the Germans have the best highways in the world. I mean, they're not even in the top ten as far as I understand safety, but in any case. Mm. So, like everything, it's probably more complicated than I, I can even explain, but um, yeah. that's, that's what one. What <laughs> One of the big themes in the book, maybe the largest theme uh, that I detected, was that uh, the, the, the safer you try to make uh, driving, the, the, the more dangerous you might end up making it because, uh, because it, it, it tempts a driver, it's, it's, you know, wider roads, roads with no obstacles, uh, that sort of thing, would tempt drivers to take greater risks and also lull them into inattention. Uh, and so you have this sort of paradoxical uh, uh, fact. Well, a good example is I, I've always loved in, in France, uh, so many of the roads, um, particularly in the country, are allées, which are lined mm -hmm. with trees. And I know people have said, you know, this is a typical example of how the French 
value aesthetics over, over safety because, of course, it's very nice to drive down a road that's lined with, uh, with nicely trimmed trees, but if you, if you uh, uh, veer off the road, you're going to hit one of those trees and you might end up getting wrapped around it. And um, so I thought, yeah, well, this is a real conflict of values, aesthetics versus safety. And the French resolve it one way. We, we resolve it the other by taking down a lot of trees by the roads. But you pointed out that when you, when you remove trees you know, near a road, you actually could be making it uh, more dangerous for the driver, not less dangerous. And could you explain, uh, if, I, if I'm, uh, uh, my interpretation of you is correct, could, could you explain the, the, that? Yeah, and I, I guess we do need to differentiate between, and this is what, what Hans Monderman, this, this Dutch traffic engineer, was sort of getting at. He talked about uh, the highway world, the traffic world, and the social world. And, you know, on the, on the interstate highways, I mean, there's a clear rationale for not having things like trees planted on the side of the roads. And they, they, they keep refining the science of, of even things like guardrails, so that if you do strike a guardrail, you know, it might not send you back out into traffic. But, you know, I think, so I don't really have a qualm with that per se, but, you know, the problem is, is there are sort of these other roads we have to deal with, and places where people live, and, I, you know, I just put, I had to put something on my uh, blog about this, because there was a piece in the Times on Saturday by a, a, a writer on the op-ed page talking about a, her town in Connecticut, there's this tree in the middle of a junction, and, you know, how she thought it was this great symbol of kind of an older time, and how in the modern world we tend to strip all these things out and make it absolutely homogenous, and, you know, so it's all about context, I mean, there's absolutely nothing dangerous about that tree if you're going at an appropriate speed, and I mean, it raises the question of what is the appropriate speed for that road, so, you know, you can see all sorts of examples of places that have tree-lined roads and low speeds where not a single person uh, has died, and, you know... Right. Yeah, Wouldn't but, it but also would be the case that um, if, you, if there are trees along the side of the road, fairly near the road, uh, drivers would tend to have a, a more accurate uh, 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 estimation of how fast they're actually moving. If you're if you're if you're driving down a, a big wide interstate and there's sort of nothing you know uh, at the right scale anywhere near you, you tend to underestimate how fast you're going. Whereas if you have uh, you know objects near the road that you're passing by, you you would perhaps even tend to overestimate uh, uh, your your speed. And so if you have something like trees by the side of the road, most drivers would tend would tend to drive more slowly. That's that's my understanding. And, and hence more safely. Yeah, I think at least you know, the, the, the rational driver. I, you know, and, and uh, yeah, it's the same phenomenon you see even on um, with things like uh, noise barriers on, on highways. That they, you know, when you measure the f- traffic flow, you find that people do slow down through because they're sort of like these trench-like things where you're suddenly in an enclosed space and you have walls to either side. You're just getting more. Uh, I guess it's been called optical flow. There's just more information you're having to process, and whenever you have to process more information, it actually tends to. Uh, you know, make your brain work harder, which can make things actually feel slower. So, um, you know, again, there's, uh, it, it, it's, all, it's all about context. Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> there's one, one claim that you made that made me a little bit uncomfortable. Um, you said that, um, uh, you know, we tend, when we talk about the risks of driving, we talk about, you know, the, uh, dri- the dangers of driving at night and, uh, and the danger of getting hit by a drunk driver and, and fog and that sort of thing. And you said, yes, but, but most... Most accidents occur. The great majority of crashes occur on uh, on sunny days with dry roads and sober drivers, etc. And that seems to yeah. be a little specious because, of course, the great majority of driving is done d- during the day by sober drivers and uh, um, on, on in non foggy conditions. But so, I mean, it, it seemed to be a little bit. You're creating a little bit of a misimpression there. I mean, it, it's actually true that it's it's far more dangerous to drive at night than it is during the day. It's far more dangerous to drive in foggy conditions. And, and this is something, of course, you address in the book, the, the, the peculiar dangers of driving in a fog, where mm-hmm. you can't see things, but your ability to see things is actually much more impaired than you even realize. And, of course, the, the danger of driving around drunk drivers. So, the, the, I mean, yes, it's true that most accidents happen you know, during the day on dry roads and, and, and involving sober drivers, but that's just because that represents the vast majority of actual driving. Isn't that right? No, it's absolutely right. And, and it's, it's an, an, you know, a classic exposure question, and people get this wrong in all sorts of ways. But you know, in some ways, so I, I'm, I'm absolutely conceding that point. But you know, I was in some ways just trying to call attention to the ways uh, you know, it's sort of not presented that way. And you know, for example, mm-hmm. when 
All right, so you have the statistic: ninety uh, percent of uh, fatal crashes happen on dry roads. And then you, you, you know, when you think about sort of, there's a lot of attention paid to things like tire traction, and whenever, whenever there's sort of rain or snow, you see on the sort of news, you know, crashes even attributed to the uh, weather, uh, even fatal crashes. And you know, that's sort of a slippery thing to do for me because how do you exactly? How do you exactly attribute it to the weather? I mean, was the person driving in an appropriate way for that weather? Uh, you never hear crashes attributed to the weather on uh, the dry days, even though there are more crashes. Um, and, and you're absolutely right that the fatal crashes are overrepresented on uh, in at night and on weekend nights, especially. And some of that's a darkness thing, and some of it's a uh, drunkenness thing. So, um, you know, but again, I was trying to because there have been interesting studies done about the effects of snowfall and how. You know, even on uh, you know those days, the fatal crash risk can actually go down, and that might again be mm -hmm. people making behavioral adaptation and, and not leaving the house, or it might be driving uh, you know appropriate for conditions. Um, but I, I, I do think there's you know in general it raises a question of, of how you know what what we think is safe for what reason, and I mean to my mind, driving in the country on a sunny day would be sort of nirvana and is like the greatest thing mm -hmm. in the world, but. You know, those roads are statistically the most dangerous per mile traveled, and uh, a lot of those crashes are happening during that great weather. So, you know, yeah, this stuff is very complicated, like any sort of uh, epidemiology, and there's, you know, confounding factors and just simple exposure. So, um, but I, I did want to call attention to some of the potential risk kind of adaptation yeah, yeah. things going on underneath, but, you know. A couple of a couple of findings in, in your book really surprised me. Like the the, the, uh, the finding that that uh, apparently doctors are uh, disproportionately prone to get involved in, in uh, car accidents. Uh, I I had no idea that was the case. And uh, why should doctors be more likely to get into uh, car crashes than say, you know, firemen? Well, I mean, this was from one uh, company's uh, studying of their claims, and you know, so we have to take this with you know. It's the, their data, but, um, uh -huh. but you know we can see that one study did look at interns. You know, you, you can imagine interns logging these incredibly long shifts. And oh yeah, then they work just, eighty hours a week. Yeah, and then just the fatigue factor, and fatigue being this sort of hidden, you know, you know, incredible cause of crashes. Um, another another simple demographic factor is that uh, in the U.S., more doctors are still men. Men are more mm, right. overrepresented in crashes. So. You know, you start to see how these things uh, interact with each other, and then just given the exposure thing, you mentioned firemen. You know, we can imagine that firemen are probably doing less driving than many other professions because they're often, you know, basically sitting at the firehouse, and um, yeah, when yeah. they're when they're driving, they're driving their large truck with the sirens going. But um, you know, doctors might do. You know, certain professions definitely do. You know, salespeople, uh, truck drivers, obviously, and, and you know, the company car is the most uh, hazard uh, environment for the American worker. So, in mm -hmm. any case. Um, yeah, doctors. Who 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 to thunk it? Yeah, yeah, and also that you pointed out that 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 uh, uh, newer cars are disproportionately involved in crashes, and 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 in, in, I, indeed, I believe uh, uh, there's a greater fatality rate for um, uh, new cars, uh, which is completely counterintuitive because you'd think that a new car has all kinds of additional safety features. It'll have a front airbag and a side airbag and that sort of thing. But I think that you you you, you observe that whenever there's something that would seem to lower the risk, that would seem to lower the perceived danger. Drivers always react to it. I, I believe you use the term risk uh, homeostasis, that they, they'll, they'll, they'll take a proportionate set of increased uh, risks in their driving. And so they're, the net effect is they're, they're no safer than they were, or they may even be less safe. But it, it is true that, I, that, that, the, that newer cars are disproportionately involved in uh, crashes. It, it, yeah, I mean, this was a study I saw from uh, Norway, and then it was confirmed for me by some people here. But again, you know, not to misrepresent this entirely, there is, again, going back classic uh, exposure question. Uh, when you buy a new car, you, you tend to be buying it because you're doing a lot of driving, or you, you'll, you'll then drive that new car the most of, of your entire yeah, fleet. Yeah. You, might, you might have sort of the old clunker sitting in the yard. So, um, But again, and I, I do think underlying there is that just basic notion of risk adaptation. These are the things that are inc incredibly hard to puzzle out because we can't exactly query uh, the victims of fatal crashes as to what their motivations were, why they were driving a certain way they were driving. And um, but you know, it, it does raise this question that we've seen with many new safety technologies that have been brought in. Uh, this has been called everything from the Peltzman effect to risk homeostasis, and this could be an entire book unto itself, really. Um, mm. But 
you know, I mean, it's sort of as a no-brainer. I mean, if you were given a, a 2008, you know, sort of Mercedes with 27 airbags versus uh, your, your uncle's Yugo from the 1970s with, you know, a, a, a sort of a death trap on wheels, you know, how would your behavior, you know, would you drive the, each car exactly the same way? Um, <laughs> I, was I, don't, being, I haven't uh, driven a Yugo lately, so I'm not sure. But uh, <laughs> I was being chauffeured around by a... Uh, a, a nine-year-old um, a philosopher uh, recently in uh, in a city that I won't name, and uh, who was a little bit like Mr. Magoo, and we were trying to get to a restaurant and going down a freeway, and there was one near miss after another, none of which he was aware of, um, and I, I thought, thank God, this man has a a brand new, you know, uh, uh, expensive model of Mercedes Benz because it's the only thing that's going to save my life. We're going to get into a crash. There's no question about it. But I'll probably walk away with it because this Mercedes Benz has the has the uh, the you know the, the soundest you know anti-crash structure practically of any car. And in fact, we of course didn't get into a crash. But uh, right. <laughs> uh, you, I know you drive a Volvo. I read that in the uh, flap uh, copy of your uh, in the uh, author, author's bio in your book. And so uh, a Volvo is a notoriously safe car. It's, uh, uh, do, you, do you feel you take uh, 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 additional risks because you're driving a Volvo and not a, uh, uh, a Geo? Well, I mean, I, I think not because it's, I own one of the smaller Volvos. This is an incredibly small vehicle. Ah. I mean, it, it, it makes, it, it, in somewhere like the Netherlands where it's actually manufactured, go figure, um, har- hardly a car, car manufacturing powerhouse. But, um, you know, that Volvo is a sort of a normal car in the Netherlands, but here it's, you know, it's incredibly small. So I, I think there's that whole argument, too, that driving smaller okay. cars. Um, and then you, you try to dive into the crash statistics on smaller cars, and you're talking about, well, a lot of younger drivers drive smaller cars. So, you know, it, it gets really difficult to sort all these things out and figure out how yeah. what's being driven in what way. But, um, yeah, I, I, in some ways I'd simply drive a Volvo because it almost seems to be required in uh, – Brooklyn or, or Subarus, of course. <laughs> Subarus are actually the new Volvos, I think. But um, you know, Volvos are almost a little old school at this point. But um, in any case, I mean, was it was it Stanley Fish, uh, the uh, the uh, the academic uh, uh, theorist who I think I believe he wrote a paper call about the academic the tendency of university professors to drive your, the, the car you, you drive, and it was called the unbearable ugliness of Volvos. Was that right? Uh, maybe <laughs> Probably, it was Sobs. or was it Sobs? Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, was it Sobs? Sobs yeah. definitely. Uh, anyway, um, let's see, one fascinating question I want to get to is the the, the very vexed issue of of of, uh, of the sexes in driving, uh, women drivers versus men drivers, and this is almost a continuation of the battle of the sexes out on the on the road. And um, I was a little bit, dis- you know, I'm not, not terribly surprised to discover that uh, men uh, call, uh, male drivers cause more fatal. Uh, crashes, I believe. Uh, uh, women drivers cause more non-fatal crashes. Is that right? That's. I mean, the one I've seen one good study from Johns Hopkins. I mean, again, the non-fatal stuff is really hard to, you know, disaggregate, etc. Um, but you know, the fatal stuff. You're, is being, you're, you're being way too scholarly and too cautious, by the way. I, I keep trying to <laughs> make you to make, you know, sort of shocking generalizations, and you've you've been uh, you've been sort of captured by the scientific uh, mentality okay, well, um, of the, the subject. Uh, I just want to say, in the, in the, 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 the book is, is even racier than, uh, than Tom is, is making it seem. He's, he's, I would say that um, men drive from Venus and uh, women drive from there, Mars. There we or go. No, uh, no, uh, yeah, definitely Excellent. men. Um, men find ways to act uh, more aggressively on the road, and they tend to pay the price for it. And you know, uh, you know, we can see this in any number of things. So yeah, let's just put that on the table. I mean, I think women are. Women, I think, are closing the gap in some ways, but um, you know, this gets into all sorts of weird issues about you know what is skill in driving. I, I just took a, uh, a British driving test as a bit a bit of a stunt. I wanted to see how I would do at age forty, just taking a driving test and then taking something notoriously difficult like the British driving test. And uh, what you find with that test, you know, is the, the people who do the best on the in-car portion of the test, um, which I failed. We can return to that if you want, but. Are, are young males, and uh, then who goes on to have the highest crash rate? Uh, the same young males. So you, you get these all sorts of funny questions about what a quote unquote good driver is, and um, you know it doesn't always shake out the way you might want it to. But mm-hmm. anyway, when, just while we're on this point, um, mm-hmm. one one uh, sort of fascinating bit of analysis in your book uh, was that even though even if if women are in some sense they're not as uh, good at driving as men. You, you, you want to live in a country 
where there are lots of women in government. Because the, the more women you have in government, the more corrupt the country is, is, is going to be on average. I would say the less corrupt the, country, yeah. the, the countries would be. More women equals less in government equals less corruption. And less corrupt countries are far safer, have far safer traffic statistics than more corrupt countries. And, of course, the, the example you use is um, uh, the Netherlands versus Belgium, which are, you know, demographically quite similar countries, European countries that border on each other. But the Netherlands, is, it's far safer to be a driver in the Netherlands than it is in Belgium. And, and part of your, I believe part of your explanation, that was the, there's a greater, there's greater sort of transparency in, Bel, in uh, the Netherlands. Uh, Belgium tends to be uh, more corrupt and therefore less respect for the laws uh, and, yeah, I mean, and greater lawlessness on the road. Yeah, I mean, because the two countries, you look at all sorts of other indices like GDP, and they they come out sort of the same. And Belgians even live longer on average. Then it's sort of surprising that they, uh, you know, die more often on the roads. And, um, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, Belgium comes out worse on this corruption index, if, you know, if we want to believe that. Um, But I think these things are are somewhat valid. And um, and there just seems to be... I believe you said Finland is the safest as the... uh the safest roads in the uh, in the world, or not the safest roads, it's, it's safer to be a driver in Finland than in any other country in the world. The, and Finland are, has the great, I think the, the most transparent, is rated uh, the most transparent, least corrupt economy in the world, and also has the greatest proportion of women in government of any, of any uh, nation in the world. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. And um, they're up there with, you know, Sweden, and Sweden's up there, and, and, and Denmark. And, um, yeah, and the thing about Belgium is you could, even, you could even divide it up a bit further and get into the whole, like, sort of... Uh, you know, Flemish thing and, and sort of the way the country is increasingly divided and uh, yeah, northern yeah. Belgium looks a lot different than southern Belgium huh, in terms of things like following uh, road laws. And you, so you can, and you, within countries, you can break this stuff up even further. Like in Italy, northern Italy is a lot safer than southern Italy. Um, mm-hmm. Anyway, so there's, you know, that kind of another uh, way to, to divide this up. I think the southern Belgian, yeah, yeah. Belgians were acting more like the French, but the French have since gotten their act together a little bit and um, have eliminated things like the old uh, uh, mass traffic ticket forgiveness program that, that Oh, right. Shira- time a new uh, president uh, comes that, into office. Yeah, yeah. It, exactly. So, um, very popular yeah, the, thing. And <laughs> the French well, are driving a little bit better. Mm-hmm. Sorry. Well, one thing that uh, 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 just a, a you know, casual observation of my own, when I drive in France, uh, I tend to, I'm happy driving at, you know, 140, 150 kilometers an hour, which is very fast, about 90, 90, 80 to 90 miles an hour. I would never think of doing that in the United States. And I don't know why. I mean, even driving around in Paris, I'm a much more aggressive driver than I am in the United States. And uh, it, it, is it, could, are the roads better engineered in, uh, in, in, in European countries, by and large, uh, than uh, they are in, in this country? What, what, why do Europeans get to drive faster on their highways <laughs> than, than we do, and seemingly safely? It's a really good question. And, you know, I, was, I, I once had the experience of um, being late for a flight at uh, Leonardo da Vinci Airport in Rome, and I was in... Uh, up in uh, Umbria and had to really um, drive faster than I'm really accustomed to. And uh, because of one of those quirks at the rental car agency, I had a Jaguar. And uh, I was going at speeds that I've never, ever approached again. Uh, and I made it to the flight on time and just acting like an absolute maniac. On, on, um, but, you know, hey, could, you feel your te- well, could you feel your testosterone levels surging as you were doing that? Because I, I, I felt that way. Exactly. I was, I was I, <laughs> singing arias from from you know the great Italian operas, and you know, uh, and, and and you know, uh, I was driving this car that was built for this sort of performance, and I was on the Italian Autostrada, which is, let's face it, it's, it's, there are fewer cars on it. It's an expensive road to drive. I mean, you have to pay basically when you get on and get off, and you know, based on your distance, and uh, there's less traffic. It's it's sort of more open. You find this. This is one of the things you find with Europe. Is you know, quite honestly, it's a it's a a wealthier driving demo. It costs more to run a car in Europe and to drive, so you just get fewer right. people on the roads in many cases. Um, and it, but in any case, you know, it's like it's sort of like why do I not jaywalk when I go to Copenhagen? It's like it's, there's that um, norm out there of what people are doing that I think you just sort of fall in. You, you want to be like the Danes. You want right. to be like the Italians when you're there, and you, you don't want to but sort it, of stand out. Um, yeah. You know, so. But as you pointed out, just on the, on the subject of jaywalking, uh, <laughs> you know, it's much more common to jaywalk. You know, New Yorkers jaywalk all the time. Uh, in Copenhagen, people, even in the middle of the night, if there's you know, no traffic for miles around, people will not cross the street until they get the equivalent of a walk sign. But, yeah, it's not, but it's not just the... Uh, 
uh, it's not just social norms. I think you yourself pointed this out. In, it's easier to cross a street in, in Copenhagen than it is in New York. You have to wait less time on average. The, the, uh, you, you, you only have to wait uh, 30 seconds as opposed to 60 seconds. And when, the, you know, the easier you make it to cross a street, the less jaywalking you'll have. And, and when, it's, you know, when, the, when you have to wait a long, long time to get a walk sign, you're much more likely to jaywalk because people don't like waiting. Exactly, and, and 30 seconds, I think, seems to be the, um, the magic cutoff point, although in New York, I think it's more like three seconds. But, um, you know, <laughs> yeah, they, they found this in, in London. Like, you know, like from one inter- intersection to the next, the jaywalking uh, profile, if you will, actually changes. So it's not like you go <laughs> from one block to the next, the culture has radically changed. I mean, it might change a little bit, who knows, but it's just all about the timing of the light. And I, 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 uh, Richard Larson, who's a kind of a queuing expert at MIT, even suggests that, you know, Pedestrians might act better if we have these countdown signals now that we, you might see. We we don't really have them in New York so much, but you know it tells you how much time you have left to cross the street. And uh, Larson has actually suggested it might be better to tell pedestrians how much time they have to wait before they can cross the street. Mm-hmm. So you know it's it's all about how do you manage this information, and it's sort of like the Disneyland effect of you know telling people how long they have to wait to wait in line for the ride. Right, and, you right. know we. So we, we act, I think, according to this information and, you know, irrationally, irrationally. And uh, in New York, I think all bets are generally off, though. Just yeah, In some cases, don't you actually feel like you're being pushed off the sidewalk by the, the sheer uh, swelling of crowds at, uh, inter- at, at, at mm-hmm. you know, corners? Mm-hmm. I don't know. It's sort of a push-pull yeah. thing going on there, I think, but... Um, it, w- w- another, uh, I'm being a little bit uh, r- random here, just f- things that struck me in, uh, uh, in your book. Um, your discussion of uh, the way uh, drivers interact with bicyclists. And um, you, I think you, you pointed out, or it, it seemed to be an implication of what, you, of, 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 uh, of, of what you wrote, that you're actually safer if you're a bicyclist, if you're a male bicyclist like me. If I get on a bike, I'm better off putting on a woman's wig that a helmet. True well, or false? Yeah, I mean, this guy in Walker who did this, I mean, he found that drivers gave him more space as a, you know, as a at least uh, trying to appear as a woman. And um, but they, you know, they weren't sure whether he was actually a woman or just a crazy guy wearing a woman's wig. Yeah, and exactly. either way, you want to give a little more space, right? <laughs> so there is that. I mean, they did give him, and they gave him more room as a male without a helmet. So they they assumed that maybe he was less experienced and. You know, I, I guess the space you have to trade off. Did the, did the speed change? You know, I mean, so it, it's one of these open questions out there that you think it's sort of 100% certainty to install a bike lane that that's a good thing and, and it's going to make people act in the right way. But, you know, we have a way to, yeah. to sort of uh, adapt to any, you know, in an engineering solution in, in the best, in most counterintuitive way possible. And so I, I think it's sort of an open question. I mean, I, I guess the best thing would be a separated bike lane. But um, I, you know, I ride on bikes. Uh, I ride on streets in New York that have no lane all the time, and it, you know, mm-hmm. I don't f- always feel like I'm being aggressively, uh, you, know, f- you know, driven closely to. And I don't, I don't often feel that safe in the bike lane. Number one, because I'm often forced to get out of the bike lane because of all mm-hmm. the joggers and joggers, dog walkers, parked cars, um, skateboarders. Wrong way cyclists and uh, everyone else who feels uh, free to use the bike lane. That, that's just mm. my rant, if you'll excuse it for a moment. Right. I think I mean, one uh, study uh, you cited uh, bicyclists who gave uh, signals when they were going to turn actually were, uh, were in greater danger than bicyclists who didn't sing- signal. Because, uh, w- and why should that be, if I, if I got that right? Well, this was Ian Walker again, and he, and he was finding that the people, his theory was that people were, were processing. I mean, a couple of things. One, they might have been processing people as humans, and then that kind of messed with their reaction time a little bit because there might have been a little bit more of uh, what he calls, and to get scientific and uh, socio-cognitive processing. Um, and then we just have that idea of everyone's got a sort of different version of what is supposed to happen on the roads and why. And you know, none of us have really memorized the, the traffic code. I mean, the, the English traffic code I went through was five five books of various sizes, and you know, I. I cannot tell you the exact distance, stopping distance uh, in front of, you know, et cetera. So I mean, we're all, we all have these just images of what's supposed to be the right way, and it's quite easy to see how they would basically get into conflict with, with one another. And, um, mm-hmm. you know, so. Yeah. Um, By the way, I think your, your description of uh, the driving culture in, uh, in Delhi in India was absolutely fascinating. Uh, 
and um, and full of full of humor. I love that some of the signs uh, that you you would see in uh, when you were in Delhi that you mentioned uh, to, uh, cautioning drivers to drive safely. One of them, I think, said um, uh, that was cautioning against against uh, dr- uh, driving while drowsy. It was something like. Um, uh, don't dream, otherwise you'll scream. Yes, and I thought exactly. only in India would you go. But you said there must be a bureaucrat somewhere in the Indian in the municipal government with the soul of a poet, which I thought was wonderful. And also the, the, the prevalence of, uh, of cows uh, along the road, on the side of the road. And you said, I think, that they, the cows were acted as mental speed bumps and, and somehow calmed the, Indian, the Delhi traffic, which seemed to be in the, a great need of calming. Well, and, yeah, this is a point that um, the, the former top cop of Delhi, a kind of controversial figure, and he, he, I love that they also now plays Colonel Pinto in, in Sesame Street in, in India. Um, but in any case, um, you know, wonderful guy. And, um, you know, yeah, he, it, it, like, like everything in traffic, it seems to be, you know, six of one, half dozen of the other. You, you know, yes, cows are, quote, unquote, a hazard. They're wandering around the streets willy-nilly. They're... They're sitting on the, the median. They, the, they seem to like the median islands, I think, because uh, I was told they, the passing cars uh, keep blow the flies away, basically. Um, <laughs> and, you know, but on the other hand, uh, they make people slow down because who wants to hit a cow in Delhi? And, you know, yes, it's a hazard if you're acting in a hazardous way. I mean, a cow doesn't move that fast, let's face it. So, you know, like anything, it's one, one solution isn't necessarily getting rid of cows on Indian streets will not necessarily make uh, the streets safer, in, in my opinion, at least. Um, mm-hmm. But someone, I, you know, it's hard not to write a fascinating description of, of Indian traffic life because it just is fascinating. Oh, you're being and too so, modest. Yeah, well, no, but someone should, I mean, there's a novel, I think, just to be written, uh, you know, if Calvin Trillin would reset, uh, what's it called, uh, Tepper isn't going out, um, his novel about New York City parking, if he would somehow transfer mm-hmm. that to Delhi, I think, you know, mm-hmm. it, it, someone should do it. By the way, I'm feeling a little guilty because I've I've I've, I've scanted some of the the intellectually meaty topics in your book. And there, I just to name a few. There's something called uh, is it is it uh, 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 the the brace paradox? B R A E S S. Am I pronouncing that name correctly? Uh, yes, which sounds I know like the lost uh, Robert Ludlum novel, but um, you yeah, know, uh, yeah, and and, and well, the brace paradox honest, that... is that in, in certain circumstances. If you if you add additional road capacity, even if the traffic stays the same, even if there's no additional traffic brought on through by that, you can still cause less flow. Which you know, which is completely. I mean, it, you know, it's obvious that if you build, you know, if you a- add to the road capacity, more people will choose to drive, and you might have greater uh, 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 traffic uh, uh, gridlock and bottlenecks. But the idea of if you add a- another road. And there's no increase in traffic on the road. You can still have greater uh, 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 sort of blockage of flow. This seems to be, you know, completely uh, counterintuitive to me. But apparently, it's true. It's almost a, a it's almost a mathematical theorem. Uh, I mean, this well, is one of the things that, that made me. Also, something called uh, Smead's law, uh, which you you, <laughs> you want to give a, a brief characterization of that? Sure. Uh, Smead's law. I mean, Smead was a British, you know, sort of re- traffic researcher in the 50s, and he found that, you know, basically as car as societies began to motorize, uh, the fatalities would rise uh, with, with each car, and it sort of makes sense. And it's what's has been happening in China over the last, you know, 10 years. And uh, but then at a certain point, you, you reach this sort of plateau, and even as more cars begin to continue to be added, the the rate of fatalities actually drops. And his theory was that, you know, basically there was. Uh, Sort of a, one thing was a societal learning curve, basically uh, learning how to deal with the automobile, in part sweeping everyone else off the road, all sorts of other road users. Uh, the other thing is basically um, those com- the countries were also becoming richer, and you could then begin doing things like building better infrastructure, having safer cars, and getting people who basically acted in a, in a more you know cautious manner. And um, so, mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, Smeed's Law. And where, 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 where? Where is the United States on, on this curve? I, I, I read in the paper just uh, in the New York Times uh, a couple of days ago, there was an article about the um, increase in motorcycle fatalities. But the, the article pointed out that the, uh, the fatality rate in the United States uh, had dropped from something like 2.4 deaths per 100 million miles driven in 1987 to about 1.3 uh, deaths per 100 million miles driven in 2005, uh, why should there have been this 
this sort of rather marked uh, drop in traffic fatalities per mile driven in the United States in this period, are we still moving along the Smeed's law curve? Or uh, do you have any thoughts about this? Yeah, I mean, theoretically, we should be. I mean, we, we started to crest in the, the 50s, and, and you had you had over 50,000 people a year being killed when there were, you know, obviously a lot fewer Americans and a lot fewer cars being driven fewer miles. So absolutely, the roads have gotten safer. But um, in, in some ways, we haven't, you know, continued to fall the way, you know, Canada, for example, uh, halved its traffic fatalities from the mid-'80s to about 2,000, and we didn't come anywhere close to half. We might maybe drop 10%. So... Um, you know, it's and we're, we no longer are in the top ten of traffic safety worldwide. So you know, there's all sorts of arguments why, but we still but have. This is the period. Um, I mean, where, where, where cars were getting bigger, and uh, and uh, speed limits were being increased. I mean, there was still a lot of, era of states that had the the old 55 mile an hour speed limit, probably as late as 1987, and they were all raised to 65 or more. And uh, I mean, I guess you know, cars have more airbags, but as you point out, you know, air, airbags, you know, they, they they confer some safety on you, but yeah, you're actually, if you're driving with somebody, if you're if you're a passenger uh, in a car, you're better off. I think you pointed out sitting in the back seat than you are yes. sitting in the front seat, even if this front seat has has uh, airbags. Is that right? Yes, yes. And I, I know it okay. feels weird for weird for most people, but you know, to, to not. And you be also have that, that lovely <laughs> sensation of being chauffeured, which I uh, you, yes. you you feel your your Michael Bloomberg. Uh, exactly. Let me just. I've got, we should probably uh, we've 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 been uh, uh, talking for a while now. We should probably wrap up. But let me just. Uh, one of the, uh, the your book was, was so pleasurable and so intellectually stimulating. The only thing about it that, that frustrated me a bit was that it's so nuanced that, that it's very hard <laughs> to see what the take that you know what the, that awful term the takeaway is. I thought you know how can how can this you know presumably if everyone in the United States read this book they would all be operating with the most sophisticated understanding of traffic of the activity they're engaging in when they get out on the road. So, but what sh what should they actually do? To, to, you know, drive more safely, to facilitate the flow of traffic, and I thought, you know, you know, one one uh, uh, lesson seems to be, you know, the, the, the more the less heterogeneous the are, we are, the more similar we are in our driving habits, the, you know, the better off we'll all be. I, I, I'm sorry, that's a, that's a little bit off, I, I realize, but but beyond that, I mean, another lesson seemed to be don't tailgate. Uh, <laughs> I mean, tailgating is al always, and you know everywhere wrong to do. And by the, way, the only funny bumper sticker I've ever seen uh, on the back of a car uh, is um, uh, a, a guy had a bumper sticker that said, uh, unless you're a hemorrhoid, get off my ass, <laughs> which I thought was reasonably funny. I love the, the frank admission that his, his rectal health may not be everything it should be. Anyway, right. but, so, but, but another time you say, you know, some, sometimes we overreact, sometimes we underreact, sometimes we, 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 you know, we brake harder than we should, sometimes we don't accelerate fast enough, and I thought, well, you know, what, what can I do the next time we get out of the road to, to, to be safe for myself and to, uh, and to, you know, make everything go as well as possible for my fellow drivers? Well, I mean, let's face it. I mean, there's nothing, there's nothing I can say that wouldn't have been told to you in driving school, with a few exceptions. I mean, like uh, the way you act around heavy trucks. I mean, cars actually seem to be, uh, have a greater responsibility for car-truck collisions, even though trucks obviously cause the most damage, but, um, I mean, since you mentioned tailgating, this is another great thing about kind of non-linearity of uh, traffic. I mean, there was, by tailgating, you're obviously reducing your own reaction time, but it's just a no-brainer that you're also reducing the react reaction time of the person behind you. So why you, why you should want to rely on someone else's uh, good reflexes or the fact that they're paying attention, I mean, you sort of want to give that, give that person as much of a cushion as possible as well. Mm -hmm. And they, they, the fascinating study done in Minnesota by analyzing these sensors in the road and looking at a crash that happened, they, they sort of worked out that it was a chain of seven vehicles and the, the seventh crashed into the sixth. You think, oh, fine, you're that, that guy, that sixth, seventh guy was following too closely. It's always the rear end, you know, collision person that's responsible. But they, by breaking down where each car was and what they had done, they found that it was really the third one that had sort of reacted too late and it sort of messed up the reaction times of mm. all the other drivers in this chain. So, you know, it just kind of works in that non-linear way where one person's reaction might sort of amplify up the line and, um, you know, work out worse for someone who has no reason why things have suddenly gotten so bad. Um, so, right, but, well, yeah. one really, <laughs> one, one, in addition to that, one, one, one principle that you articulated very clearly is uh, uh, look where you want to go. 
In other words, it, and you, I mean, you, you uh, uh, it's been, it, studies have shown that people tend to, when they're driving, they tend to follow their gaze. And so if you're, I, I notice this all the time when I'm jogging in suburban areas, and, uh, you know, I, uh, women are coming, uh, what should I say women, drivers are coming at me, and I'm on the side of the road. When, when they look at me, they tend to steer toward me, which is a little scary. And I think you call this the, 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 uh, the or, or uh, it's called the moth effect, that you tend to, you tend to uh, steer your car in the direction you're looking. And so this is, this is bad most of the time. But as you pointed out, in, in uh, cases where you're, you know, you're skidding or you're in some sort of, you know, some sort of unusual, dangerous circumstances, if you, if you want to get to a certain, you know, go in a certain direction, you should, you should look in that direction. Is that, uh, am I getting this at all right or completely wrong? Yeah, no, exactly. And that, I mean, that was taught to me at this, at this uh, Bondurant uh, School of Driving, which is sort of you know, race car drivers, and they, and they bring over some, some skills that you know, are sort of sound, again, very fundamental or, or almost you know, sort of like uh, just so obvious. But I, I really found that being on this kind of skid pad, which replicates uh, snow and ice driving, that it, it just somehow did make it, work better. I, I had a better, I, I was able to turn out of this hazardous skid a little bit better if I just looked where I was going. And yeah, I mean, you do mention the moth effect, and that's still, it's still very controversial and not fully understood. Um, and it kind of comes from the idea that, that police cars are quite often struck on the side of the road, even when they're sitting there with their full flashers going. And yeah, yeah. why does that happen? And it, it, again, it's just, I mean, we think this is something we would know absolutely everything about, but it's such a complex uh, environment that these Things are, you know, still being analyzed, and, and the truth is, you know, sort of still out there. Um, so they, they only, uh, there are two more things, and then we'll, we'll quit. We'll, <laughs> I, I love the uh, the bit about uh, how how the, the, the proper strategy to follow when you pull into a big parking lot for a Walmart or something like that. How much time you should spend looking for a space close to the door versus uh, 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 in it, in hoping that you won't have to walk that distance and you'll save time. And the different behavior of, of women versus men. I think men tend to overestimate, uh, sort of un underestimate the time it will take to walk from the parking space to the store, whereas women go the reverse. But I think that the, the morals seem to be that, in general, you're better off taking the first available space in a parking lot and not spending any time at all trying to find a better space. Is that, is that right? Yeah, I think so. There's, there's a great um, New Yorker cartoon that um, gets at this. It shows a uh, couple in a car, and the man is driving, and, and he's pulling into a space, and the woman says, you always choose the parking space of least resistance. And, uh, you know, just sort of, yeah, it's, it was just found. I mean, it's in analyzing these Walmarts and um, whether, you know, it could be that women just choose to be, visually maintain a line of sight with the entrance of the store. Maybe that's a, a safety thing going on or, um, or any other kind of, you know, bias. Who knows? But that picker row closest space seems to work better than the endless uh, cycling. I mean, it, it could be that people are lazy and, and don't want to walk. And, you know, but in the end, sometimes they end up walking further to the entrance anyway. So, um, mm -hmm. all right, all right. you know. <laughs> Just to, in closing, did it titillate us for a moment with, with, an exciting uh, sort of future prospect for the alleviation of all of our suffering on the road. Some, some, uh, just uh, 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 give me a fantasy of a road where all the cars were sort of coordinated by some sort of uh, technology that we don't have now. Is there anything like that in prospect, or maybe it's just over the horizon that you can describe? Well, I mean, one great Driving vision I had. Nirvana. Well, and it was given to me by this uh, guy, Mitchell uh, uh, Joachim at, at MIT, or formerly of MIT. He was working on this smart car thing. He, ha he has what he calls sort of gentle congestion. And it would be cars, like urban cars, that are essentially very small and made out of something like neoprene, like, like you have on your, your sneakers, basically. And, you know, collisions would basically be a thing of the past. It would just be sort of herding going on like, uh, like sheep, basically. And we could all just sort of move around and, and gently bump each other, and it would... And these, and these things wouldn't be owned by any one person. It would be sort of a collective uh, ownership model, and you could drop it off and pick it up wherever you wanted. And um, oh. there'd be a lot of social networking, you know, like you know, sort of instant messaging built into the cars, and you could just use them to go all over. And, and the last thing is, is like the luggage racks at airports. Um, I mean, the, the uh, luggage, the things, that, the luggage trolleys. Um, you, you could fit uh, so many of these cars on a single block. I mean, he, he envisions something like. Um, I forget the exact number, like 80 cars per block, whereas currently we can fit, you know, 24 SUVs or something. So, and they would all sort of interlock like those trolleys that you get when, when mm -hmm. you rent, you know, at the airport. So, I mean, that, that's that's one idea that would be 
uh, nice for cities. It doesn't like, sound like much fun, though. Well, I, I sort of like to crash around with other people and sort of bounce, you know, sort of urban bumper cars or something. But, yeah, I guess um, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you lose the terrorizing aspect that you have of, of you know, in, in, intimidating people. But, um, you know, now, I, I, you know I, I, I do think we need at least one last discussion of um, just jokes and uh, traffic, given who I'm speaking to. Um, I hope you have the joke. Well, I mean, no, the, the jokes are incredibly bad. And, I mean, for one example, there's one from the 50s from Henry Barnes, the former traffic commissioner of New York City. And I don't even know if this is a joke so much as just a, I don't know what you would call this. He said, uh, traffic is the mother-in-law in the otherwise perfect relationship, perfect romance between the American and his automobile. And um, so, I don't know, <laughs> where did that, do you know where that mother-in-law trope came from? And obviously it, it seems dated and kind of sexist now, but... You know, do you have any comments yourself on you know where where something like that would have emerged from and where it went, or is it still with us? The mother-in-law joke. The mother-in-law joke is uh, popular because we uh, we feel pity for the uh, the man who's oppressed over by the mother-in-law, and so it illustrates the superiority theory of humor. Uh, I've never had a problem with mothers-in-law, but as as a, as a subject for jokes, what's always mystified me is why cheese should be funny. But I can't think of a tie-in between cheese and traffic, so maybe uh, we should leave it at that. Tom, um, thank you very much. It was fascinating, and uh, I wish I had, you know, gotten to more than one one hundredth of what was in your book. But uh, it's a very, very rewarding intellectually, and uh, it may even make you a better driver. Thanks, uh, not Jim. you, Tom. You're already good enough. <laughs> Take it easy. Thank you. See you.